So IIIF is a set of open standards for delivering high quality attributed digital objects online at scale. And this is the first in a series of events exploring and showcasing IIIF and how it can be used in cultural heritage. It's going to begin with an accessible introduction to IIIF. We realize that for some of you, this might be the first time you're coming across IIIF. So we hope to tell you a bit more about it and what it can be used for. And then there'll be some demonstrations of IIIF in action um, at um, some of our RAUK members. So Alison will tell you a bit more about what's been happening at Cardiff. So our first speaker is Glenn Robson, and he works for IIIF Consortium as the IIIF Technical Coordinator. He gives training and lots of advice. I'm so grateful for Glenn and all the advice he's given me in assisting the community in implementing IIIF. Before he joined the IIIF Consortium, he spent 13 years at the National Library of Wales and is joining us from Aberystwyth, um, and latterly as the head of systems. And Glenn started working with IIIF in 2013, implementing the standard at the National Library of Wales for its newspapers, photographs, archives, map, and crowdsourcing systems. So it's got lots of information. And then um, after Glenn, um, Alison Harvey will be talking, and she's based at Cardiff University Special Collections and Archives. Alison is responsible for managing the digitization workflows and supporting the teaching of digital humanities and visual culture. Um, Alison has recently completed an RAUK AHRC funded fellowship that reviewed free low infrastructure tools for creating and reusing IIIF images for digital archives exhibitions. Thank you so much, Glenn and Alison. Glenn, I'll pass over to you. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so it's a great pleasure to talk to you uh, today and give you a short kind of introduction uh, to IIIF. Um, so as Claire mentioned, um, I work for the uh, IIIF Consortium. So um, this is a number of um, organisations which kind of um, pay a fee to be kind of consortium members of the IIIF Consortium. Um, and it employs a number of staff members. So there's myself, who's the uh, technical coordinator. Uh, there's also uh, Caitlin Perry, who's the event and uh, community coordinator, and we're currently uh, looking for a new managing director uh, for the IIIF Consortium, and applications for that closed uh, yesterday. Um, so my main role is to help people uh, implement IIIF. So I work with people that are just starting on IIIF. I work with um, vendors, so people that are providing systems uh, to support IIIF. Uh, we run uh, online training sessions, and I'll talk about that later. Uh, and then I mentioned uh, funded by the IIIF Consortium. Uh, and as Claire mentioned, I, I previously worked in the National Library of Wales, so you may recognise uh, quite a few uh, of the examples in, in some of the examples I'm going to give. Um, but I'm going to give a um, very basic kind of introduction to what IIIF is. Uh, and the first way to look at it really is to look at the acronym. So it stands for the International Image Interoperability Framework, which is a real mouthful. So um, everybody calls it IIIF. Um, and that has been translated into a, a number of languages. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the, the training. So I mentioned that we do this uh, training, uh, and this is an online session, um, and I'm going to use that, and I can share the URL uh, in the chat. Um, so we have a number of different kind of workshops. Uh, we have some uh, kind of basics. Uh, this is a five-day training, which I'm going to use. Uh, we also have a making use of IIIF. So this is if you've implemented IIIF, what can you do with it afterwards? Uh, and then some uh, custom training for different kind of users uh, of IIIF. Uh, but if I start with the online workshop, so we run these, um, for this year, we're gonna run four different sessions of this, and you can uh, follow the link here to register to one of the sessions. And um, they're all at different time zones because um, the community is quite distributed. And so we run them at different time zones um, to make it accessible to different people. Um, but I'm going to cover the, uh, what is a IIIF session, session, and you're welcome to follow along. Um, so I'll put this into the chat so you can see that. Um, but the best way to look at IIIF is to look at the, the acronym and, and just go through it and see um, how it works. Um, so the first I in IIIF is for international. And this was something that was um, really looked at when we started IIIF was to make sure that it wasn't just based in one kind of locality. And that it was as an international as possible. And so when the first meeting started, they were kind of oscillating between uh, North America and Europe. Um, and now we kind of go to different places to try and spread the message of IIIF. Uh, when it first started, it was very much um, the kind of national institutions which had the funding to be able to 
uh, implement AAAF. There wasn't a lot of software available at that time. Uh, and so you had to kind of make your own um, software to implement the AAAF standards. So we had large institutions like the BNS Library Congress, British Library, uh, Austrian National Library, National Library of Wales in Scotland, uh, Oxford and Cambridge, and kind of large institutions. Um, but we also work with um, aggregators. So this is some commercial like Art Store or Content DM, uh, some other types like the Internet Archive uh, implement AAAF and also Europeana. Um, so they, Europeana in particular, are able to harvest uh, AAAF content and show it on their website uh, and work with others to implement AAAF. Uh, and then also, um, it's always been based in kind of university research. So uh, a lot of the initial um, collections um, were um, to do with research, particularly kind of manuscript research. So we had large uh, research institutions. Uh, and then also we've gone into uh, museum galleries. So National Gallery of Art in the US and the UK implement AAAF and plus uh, the J. Paul Getty Trust. Um, one of the things we've done is we've um, created this map, which is um, kind of all of the AAAF implementations that we know about. Um, so if you're not listed in this, please let us know so we can add that. Uh, sorry, I've gone call. Um, but you can see in the UK, there's quite a large uh, implementation across the UK um, in different institutions, large and small. Um, nowadays, there's um, a lot of software um, that's available. Um, and so it's very much an off the shelf. So small institutions uh, can also implement AAAF as well as larger institutions. And there's also commercial providers uh, which can provide hosting if required. Um, the second I in AAAF uh, stands for image. Uh, and this is kind of um, the, uh, the use case um, that uh, AAAF was invented for. So if you think back um, to before AAAF existed, and I worked in the National Library of Wales uh, when we were doing this, and when we provided access to the digitized images, uh, we'd provide access to a thumbnail copy and then a kind of reference web copy, uh, which wasn't huge high quality, but it was fast enough to be able to download on, on the internet. Um, but what we found out that um, whenever researchers wanted to use our material, they were really after a higher quality to be able to look at the handwriting, to be able to zoom into maps. Uh, and so quite often we would send them the archival TIFF uh, quality of the image. And what we really wanted to do was be able to provide a zoomable experience so that they could zoom into the particular part of the image that they're interested in. And so one of the standards that AAAF provides is this um, ability to zoom into images. Um, this is just an example from Stanford University of a Japanese tax map. Um, and you can see the scale of this. So this is uh, Wayne, who's uh, six foot four inches, and he was involved in the scanning uh, of this particular map. Uh, and so you can see kind of the size of this particular image. And if we open up on the Stanford website, um, you're able to zoom in um, and really kind of look into the detail of the image. Uh, and the way that AAAF kind of makes this happen is that it means that you don't have to download the full quality image. Uh, only the particular parts of the um, image that you're looking at is being sent to your screen. Um, so it means it's really, really fast to kind of zoom around and look at the different items. Uh, in this particular uh, map, the idea was that you'd kind of stand in the middle. You'd be able to look around at the different areas um, to be able to interpret it. And so you can kind of uh, recreate that with this kind of zooming experience. Um, you'll notice there's a, a star next to um, the image, um, and this is because um, the more recent versions of, um, of AAAF uh, now support um, audiovisual as well as, trip, as images, um, but unfortunately it was too late to change the name. So we did look at um, maybe renaming it IXIF, but again, that's even more of a uh, mouthful um, to be able to pronounce. So we stuck with IIIF. Um, so whenever you see image, um, also think audiovisual. Um, so this is just an example of a, a, a video resource, um, which if you click play, um, you'll be able to see it in the same kind of viewers as you would uh, an image item. Um, so I've made it full screen and I'm going to zoom in slightly as well. Uh, I don't know if that helps. Let me know if you, if you still can't see it. Um, so the X, next uh, I in AAAF is for um, interoperability. Um, and this is more complicated to kind of define uh, and it can be looked at in a number of different ways. Um, so the first one is uh, interoperable viewers. Um, and again, this is kind of one of the early use cases of AAAF uh, in that you, if you implement the standard, the promise was um, that you'd be able to open up in different viewers. And there are a number of use cases of why this is important. Um, so this is an example from the National Library of Wales. Um, it's a manuscript uh, from, I believe, a French uh, poet. 
Um, and you can see that you can open it in lots of different viewers and they all have different um, features. Um, so this is an example of um, uh, the item from the National Library of Wales. They're using a viewer called uh, the Universal Viewer, uh, which has some strengths in translation. It's also a good kind of general purpose uh, viewer. Um, it has all the metadata about the item on the right hand side and you're able to kind of browse through, through the different images uh, and do all the zooming um, that you can really expect. Uh, another type of viewer is um, Mirador. Um, so this one is um, got some more functionality. So it's got some side by side comparison. Um, so I can open up the same item twice in two different windows. Um, and you're able to do kind of detailed side by side comparison. Um, I can see there's a problem with uh, the National Library of Health at the particular moment, but uh, you can also see all of the metadata that's uh, available um, in the Universal Viewer in, in Mirador. Um, but this is much more for kind of an academic uh, use case. Um, this particular viewer is called the Curation Viewer. So this is um, a viewer from Japan. Um, it has the same functionality of being able to browse and zoom into images. Uh, you can also see the metadata um, by clicking on this one. Um, so the same metadata has come along with the item, uh, which is one of the benefits. And this particular um, viewer has some uh, features to do with reading Japanese characters. So it has some machine learning inbuilt. So you can take a item and open it up into this uh, viewer uh, and then be able to kind of run some automated processing to be able to do some OCR on those characters. Uh, another viewer, this one is called Anona from um, uh, a place in America. Um, again, you can see all of the same uh, metadata information, browse it. This particular viewer has functionality for kind of guided storytelling. Um, so you can load a set of annotations and it'll kind of guide you through the different uh, images. It's good for kind of telling stories. Um, Clover, this is from uh, Northwestern. This is a, a newer viewer. Um, so the same item again, uh, all the metadata. Um, I think this looks a nicer viewer. Uh, it's quite a clean viewer and it also supports um, audiovisual as well as um, the Universal Viewer and Mirador uh, also support uh, that feature. Um, so that's a really kind of useful use case that you can take your TripLife item and as an institution, you can choose uh, which viewer kind of fits your collection better. Um, so you might be more at a research institution, you might want to go for Mirador, uh, you might be a national institution or kind of have a more read-only interface. Um, and you can do that with, say, the Universal Viewer or Clover. And it gives you the flexibility to chop and change. So the Universal Viewer might be the most kind of featureable viewer at this moment. And then later on, it might be Clover and you can just drop in a different viewer because uh, the data stays the same. Uh, and that's one of the features um, of AAA. Another way of looking at interoperability is um, with interoperable images. And this is a, a great use case. This is from uh, the BNF. No, sorry, this one is um, from America. Um, so it's a manuscript which was uh, owned by somebody called Otto Edge. Uh, and what he did is he separated the individual leaves, the pages, uh, and he sold them to different institutions across the US. So physically at the moment, this uh, manuscript is distributed around different institutions uh, in America. Uh, and this uh, use case is they've digitized each of the individual images um, in the um, in the different institutions and they made them available as AAAF and then they've been brought together um, as a, a manuscript uh, to be displayed in a viewer. Uh, and you can view the manuscript here um, and uh, in the background it's getting all of the images from the different places dynamically and kind of bring them into a single presentation. Uh, so this is Mirador and you can browse and um, zoom uh, just as if it's any other item, um, but actually all of the images are coming from different places. And so in this item, um, it's kind of been digitally reconstructed. So even though physically it's in different places, um, it's been kind of digitally recombined uh, into this manuscript. Um, another example is the same sort of uh, recombining, um, but instead of full pages, uh, this example from the BNF um, is where the illustrations were cut out and the illustrations are actually held by a separate organization. Um, both based in Paris, and both of them have um, delivered them over to AAA. Um, but you can go to Mirador and you can click um, to add the miniature in, um, which again allows you to digitally reconstruct the manifest uh, manuscript and also zoom into the items. Um, there are a number of use cases of this kind of uh, recombining, but also um, layering of images. 
Um, so you might hear more about this in the next one from uh, Joe from the National Gallery. Um, but it's possible to layer different images on top of each other. So uh, if you've got an X-ray or infrared um, of these different images, you can layer them and kind of use this interface to um, change the opacity so you can kind of um, go between different versions. Um, so there are a couple of examples of kind of interoperable images. And I'll just reload this. Um, so for interoperable collections, um, this is again um, looking at um, being able to take content and opening them in different viewers. Um, so this is a blog by uh, Ben Arberton from Stanford University. Uh, and he was interested in bringing uh, two copies of uh, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales together. And so he's been able to recombine um, combine two versions of the manuscript from two locations. Uh, so the one on the left is from the Hunston Library um, in Los Angeles, and the one on the right is from the National Library of Wales. Um, both of them have been made available as AAAF, uh, and he has opened them uh, into Mirador and has got the side-by-side -side comparison. Um, and you can zoom into both uh, at the same time, and they're both coming dynamically from the two different institutions, and you can really do kind of serious research to be able to compare, compare uh, the two manuscripts. And it turns out that these two manuscripts um, are thought to be written by the same scribe. Uh, and it, this blog by Ben Alberton talks about the difficulty of doing it pre AAAF, where you had two different windows, two different, different interfaces, uh, and being able to do that comparison is really difficult. Whereas if you can bring them into Mirador, um, you're able to do the side by side comparison, uh, which makes it a lot easier. Um, I mentioned earlier that it's possible to um, bring, um, to use these different viewers. And one of the advantages of that is that um, the user can do this. So the user can go to say the National Library of Wales um, collection. They can say, I'm really interested in this particular uh, manuscript and they can get access to the manifest and then they can open it up in Mirador. Uh, and then they can kind of combine that with different manuscripts in different locations uh, to be able to do that. Uh, and we'll give you an example of that in a second. And then the glue that makes this happen is the standards that um, AAAF provides. Um, so there are two core standards. So the first one is the image API, uh, and that's all about zooming into images. So when you saw me kind of zoom into that map, um, that is all controlled by the image API. Uh, and there are a number of ways to implement that, but basically it's kind of choosing mostly an open source uh, image server and using that, but there are also commercial providers which will provide the image API. Uh, the presentation API is all about um, providing enough uh, information about the item um, so that a user can understand what they're looking at. It contains things like uh, metadata about the item, uh, the order of the uh, images, the pages, the uh, table of contents, uh, links to external metadata. Uh, that's all based in the presentation API. And it defines something called a manifest, uh, which we'll look at uh, next, which is that kind of core uh, information which you can take from one viewer to the next. Um, as well as these core APIs, there are a number of other ones that the community provides. So content search, which allows you to search annotations. So it's a bit like if you open up a PDF document and being able to search within that, you can do that through the content search. Authentication API is about um, protecting resources, so username and password, potentially charging for access. Um, you can do that through the authentication API. Um, change discovery is about sharing your content with aggregators like Europeana. Uh, so being able to let them know this is all the content we have and if this bit's been updated, please reharvest. You can use change discovery. Um, content state is a more complicated one. It's about sharing the view of what you're looking at. Um, so it could be that you have two manuscripts open side by side. You want to share that with a colleague. Uh, then content state API gives you kind of a method for that. Uh, and then there's been a few um, maps extensions. Uh, so one is a uh, nav place. So um, if you've got a photograph, you can kind of geolocate it to a point in the map uh, to be able to say that this photo was taken from this location. Uh, and there's also a geo, um, geo rectifying extension, um, which is if you've got a historical map, you can put points on the historical map and points on the modern map, and it will warp the historical map um, so it matches the modern map, which can be really useful for uh, comparing two different maps from two different places. Uh, and that's a re recent uh, extension. So I'm just going to give you a quick um, kind of hands-on um, guide about how this works. So uh, I mentioned this concept of manifests, which are um, kind of uh, mentioned in the AAAF presentation API. Uh, and if we just take an example of um, going to a particular AAAF institution, uh, taking that manifest and opening it in a couple of viewers, and you're welcome to have a go at this at the end of the session. Uh, all of the instructions uh, are here. 
Um, so one thing that we maintain in the AAAF Consortium is this guides um, to different institutions that support AAAF with very kind of brief uh, instructions about how to get a AAAF item. So I'm running short of time, so I'm just going to quickly choose the Folger Shakespeare Library. Uh, I'm going to go to their collections. Uh, I'm going to search for Wales, which is my kind of one that I always search for. Uh, media available online. Uh, I want to restrict it to images. And then I've got an, an item um, which, uh, when it's load, is uh, it will be a AAAF item. So the instructions on this page um, tell you how to get the AAAF manifest URL. Um, so it's linked there. So I can go to the top. I can right click and do copy link. Uh, and that's what I'm doing is I'm kind of copying the link to this manifest. Uh, and that's the thing that I can open up in different viewers. So if I go to Project Mirador, uh, this is kind of a demo version of the Mirador uh, application. I can click try a live demo. Um, it opens up on side by side comparison. I can just close these. I can click start here and it's got a list of kind of demo objects that are available in Mirador. I can paste um, this URL into here, which is the link to the manifest and click add. And then I can open up the item uh, in Mirador. I can do all of the zooming, um, but all of the images coming from the Folger Shakespeare Library. Um, I've got access to all of the metadata um, that's available with the item. Um, and I can also do the same with other viewers. So um, there's instructions here for um, being able to open up in the Universal Viewer as well. Um, so feel free to have a go at that. It's just kind of a nice way of being able to see how you can take resources from one place and open that up in a different viewer. Um, but I'll just quickly go back to the presentation. Um, so there are some more examples of using AAAF, including with crowdsourcing annotations. Um, but I just want to say, kind of add to the next steps. Um, so there are many ways that you can get involved in AAAF. Um, there's a large uh, AAAF community, which you can see from the AAAF website. Uh, we have a very active Slack channel where you're welcome to ask uh, questions. Um, and yeah, just try and use AAAF as much as possible. And if you've got any questions, uh, the community's very open and welcome uh, to questions. And I'm happy to take questions at the end of the session. So I better pause there. Thank you, Glenn. And yeah, please do pop any questions in the Q&A and we'll pick them up at the end of the session. And now I'm gonna hand over to Alison who can tell you a bit more about what she's been doing with AAA. Thank you, Claire. Okay, it's going to, is that looking okay? That looks great. Great. Oh, um, yeah, thank you, Glenn, for kicking us off with such a great overview of um, what AAAF is and everything that it has to offer. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit today about my own experience with AAAF and show you lots of examples. Um, and in case you want to follow anything up, I've added links to everything that I'm going to mention to an open Google Doc, and I'm going to share the link to that at the end. Um, yeah, it is very appropriate that I'm here with Glenn today because my own journey with AAAF started when I attended his training course that he mentioned at the start of the pandemic. And it's where I had the realization that it didn't matter that we couldn't physically access collections at that time. Uh, and it also didn't really matter that we didn't have a digital repository because others did. And because others were using AAAF, their content was interoperable and reusable. And that meant things like our book history workshops about marginalia or illustrations could still be delivered by using content from the hundred or so worldwide institutions that use AAAF. And um, I also discovered about the existence of free tools uh, that could create teaching materials using AAAF objects and a couple of those I'm going to demonstrate later. Um, so basically at that moment of global crisis that we all found ourselves in, AAAF um, was a lifeline. It allowed us to support research and deliver our teaching commitments throughout that really difficult year by drawing on the resources of a global academic community. And since then, Cardiff University has become the first university in Wales to implement a AAAF enabled digital repository of its own, very much in that spirit of wanting to contribute our own content to this community and allow it to be reused. So this is Alma Digital, uh, which is an addition to our library management system, Alma, from Ex Libris and Alma Digital makes all our content available through AAAF and is interoperably reusable under a Creative Commons license by anyone, anywhere for any purpose. And since launching Alma Digital, um, investment has continued in this area. So last year we were able to use quarter of a million in grant funding to purchase digital imaging equipment and establish a dedicated digital studio. 
This studio is equipped with everything from fast book scanner kiosks that anyone can use all the way up to a high end phase one camera system that allows our photographer to capture our most fragile and challenging items. And it's fair to say that AAAF helped us get to this point. Our journey really started by using free tools to just experiment and play to turn ideas into actual websites and exhibitions and digital collections and student assessments that allowed us to show the benefits of AAAF in proof of concept models rather than just describing them in theory. So this process has been instrumental in advocating for and developing our business case for investment. So um, I just wanted to highlight a few of the benefits of AAAF today um, before going on to demonstrate some of these tools. I'm going to do this quite briefly because Glenn's covered it in, in a lot of detail. Um, I will just say this, this firstly and possibly most famously, you've got its deep zoom for examining objects in minute detail. And you've seen this example earlier of this amazing restoration of a manuscript that once had its illustrations cut out and those objects are now held in different institutions. So you've got these opacity sliders that let you choose to view one object or another or see both of them reunited. AAAF can be used to enhance images in the browser without altering any original files. So uh, this is an example from the Internet Archive where you can edit brightness and contrast and polarity to help bring out details that might be difficult to see. AAAF viewers allow comparison of multiple objects in one browser window, even though they're held in different countries. So as, as Glenn said, this is fantastically important for research and makes people's lives so much easier. And something we're going to be talking about later is annotation. Um, so this could mean um, overlaying images on top of each other. Uh, this is a tool that lets you layer maps to visualize spatial change over time. It could also refer to transcription. So turning images of text into actual text that can be searched and then laying that text over the image. And it could refer to curatorial commentary. Um, like this interactive annotated version of the Garden of Earthly Delights by Hieronymus Bosch. So I saw examples of all this functionality during Glenn's training, but until then, I had no idea how it worked or, to be honest, what relevance it had to me as um, somebody working at an institution that didn't have access to an infrastructure that could support AAAF. And as I mentioned in 2020, we didn't even have a digital repository because we recently retired one. We were um, in the process of procuring a new one when the pandemic shut everything down. And all I had was thousands of files that had been extracted from the old repository and stored on OneDrive. So given the circumstances, I was very grateful to have them, but it was far from an ideal solution to finding the exact image that I needed for teaching or to respond to inquiries. And obviously it was very difficult to make available to others for browsing. And this led to my first unwitting introduction to a free AAAF tool, the Internet Archive, because my early lockdown days were spent uploading all of our files here. Um, and I will explain shortly how the Internet Archive supports AAAF. But um, even before I discovered this, I thought it was fantastic. Um, there are no limits on how many images you can upload here. It can group books and images into collections. They are easy to search. You can browse them with filters. All the text is OCR'd for free. So books can be searched, it's super accessible. They can be downloaded in different formats and all their metadata is visible to search engines as well. So even if people have never even heard of the Internet Archive, if they search for the title of a book on Google, they will find it there. And as if this wasn't enough, the Internet Archive is also now able to be used as a free AAAF image server. And uh, I discovered this during the training that Glenn mentioned. As he said, the documentation of this is freely available online. And, um, and you can work through this independently, or you can sign up for the five-day course uh, to benefit from lots of support from Glenn and the team. And I would really recommend this training. Um, we each built up a personal project throughout the week. And each day sort of developed what we'd learned the day before, and then demonstrated what we'd made to the group at the end. Uh, I love to learn by doing. Um, I really benefited from this very practical approach. Um, it was so satisfying as well to see everyone's projects sort of develop over time. Uh, but if five days to sound like a lot, Claire and myself will be working with RLUK to run a very entry level practical training session on the 1st of March, um, if that sounds more achievable at this point in the year.
And we began um, in the training by getting started with image servers. Um, these basically perform a set of processes on digital images that make them compatible with the AAAF framework. Um, for instance, dividing them into digital tiles. Um, that is what makes large AAAF images like this one load very quickly. And it's also what allows them to be digitally segmented in order to annotate sections of an image. Because many of us on the training course didn't have access to an image server at our institutions, Glenn taught us this trick to make our own AAAF images using the Internet Archive. And all you do is upload your image and then take its file name, whatever appears after details in the URL, and insert it into this string to create what looks like a URL. But rather than opening a web page, it's actually code. Uh, but you don't need to understand it. All you know is that it packages up three things into what's known as a manifest. So it contains all the links to the images that make up that object. It contains structural metadata that tells you how the images are ordered and presented, and it contains descriptive metadata about the object. So the manifest is really the key to bundling up everything a computer needs to know about your digital object so that you can share it with others and use it in different tools. So this Internet Archive method might seem a bit clunky, but it really represents a significant development by allowing anyone to explore the potential of AAAF for free. Well, here's this manifest that I just made from the Internet Archive loaded in a AAAF viewer called Mirador. So the viewer fetches the images from the links provided in the manifest and the code tells it how to organize them. The metadata on the left was also pulled in from the manifest, and in that way, it always stays connected to the digital object. So a AAAF image can never be orphaned from its original context. So you might be thinking, what does this achieve? Uh, the object is already online at the Internet Archive, so you can already share a link to it. But what you can't do without AAAF is easily share a particular section of a particular page. So if you take these medieval cats, for instance, I might want to share this specific detail of this manuscript for any number of reasons. So I might be um, an archivist who's providing research assistance to a scholar of medieval cats. I might be a researcher who is citing a new medieval cat discovery in an academic publication. Or I could be a PhD student of medieval cats working on my supervisor. Or maybe a curator planning an exhibition on medieval cats or a conservator debating potential repairs to an image of the medieval cat. But my, my point is there are so many use cases for AAAF in heritage and higher education. And someone receiving a link to a detail like that can open it up in any AAAF viewer. So as Glenn said, there are a few different kinds available. They all have different layouts and functionality and everyone has their own preference. This is an alternative to Mirador called Universal Viewer. It shows thumbnails of the other pages in the object on the left, and it lets you see the metadata at the same time on the right. But whichever viewer you choose, they all have huge advantages over sending someone an isolated screenshot of a detail. All of them let the recipient see the detail in the context of the wider object, and also see the full bibliographic details, including the location of the original. One of Mirador's advantages is being able to open up multiple manifests from digital objects all over the world and then export them as a collection, as an interactive workspace. You can go back to your workspace at a later date, or you can share it with others to work collaboratively. And again, this is not just a collection of images, but it's more like a map that traces paths from images to their objects and then back to the repositories in which they were found. So I could go up to the top right image, for example, and scroll through the rest of the pages or click a link that would take me to the BNF catalog to see what else they have. Um, these images don't exist in isolation. So, so far we've used AAAF to take a local JPEG object and turn it into a global AAAF object. And next we're going to transform it into a whole new object enhanced with annotations. So we've seen this done in the example of the Garden of Earthly Delights earlier, how an image rich with weird and wonderful meaning has been enhanced with an interactive commentary. And that example was probably put together by a developer, but um, it's possible to make something similar for free with no coding knowledge. This is an example of an annotated painting by Manet, which has been made using a tool called Stories. 
This is um, free and anyone can use it. It works by just uploading an image, zooming into details and adding text to any area of interest that you want to highlight. And this is the final result. It creates a presentation that just moves through the annotated areas in order. This is the editing interface. It's really nice and simple. Stories can only edit a single image, uh, which would be great for exhibitions and teaching or as a close reading exercise, maybe for students. Um, perfect for art history, but it could be used for any discipline really that requires image analysis, even something like anatomy or botany. Um, very, very easy to get started. You can either paste in a manifest that you found or made or upload a regular JPEG. And this is Story's big advantage. It will make a AAAF image for you from your JPEG. It works best if the JPEG is very large. Um, if the file is too small, you won't be able to zoom in far enough to make uh, useful annotations. It just won't look very good. So um, in this example, I've loaded a manifest map of America. Uh, I've given it a not very imaginative title. I could add um, an author, a description, or some credits if needed, but those fields are, are all optional. I do need to provide an email address, but this is only used to send links to the finished presentation. Stories is web-based. Um, you don't download anything or even log in, but because it doesn't maintain user accounts, uh, the links that are emailed to you are the only way to get back to your presentation in order to view it, share it, or edit it. So this is the editing interface. Uh, it first loads up the entire image, and then all you do is zoom in, pan around until you find a detail that you want to comment on, and then click Add New to add an annotation. And then you just repeat this process for all the notes that you want to make. When you click Submit, the annotation gets saved to the section that's been zoomed into. So I've annotated some states here just as an example, but you could use this with an image of anything and annotate it for any purpose. You can go back and edit the annotations, you can delete them, you can drag and drop them to reorder them as well. And when you're finished, you can use preview up in the top right hand corner to see the results or links to copy those sharing and editing links. If you want to make something similar, but with multiple images, you could try exhibit. Exhibit works with multiple images and even with multiple objects, but unlike stories, it has to be used with an object that's already available via AAAF. If you don't have one, you could use the Internet Archive method that I mentioned earlier to make one. Exhibit was developed during the COVID pandemic to assist library and academic staff tasked with delivering remote teaching with rare books and archives. Uh, but even now, it continues to be invaluable as a free tool for creating very professional interactive presentations and quizzes for engagement and education. Like Stories, it is free, uh, web-based and easy to use. And this is the editor. Again, it's nice and simple. Uh, you just start by choosing your template from those options. Uh, the kiosk plays pre-timed images on a loop. Scroll lets you move through images from top to bottom, so more like a web page. Uh, slides move left to right, like a PowerPoint slideshow. And quiz lets you create multiple choice questions. The presentation needs a title, an author, and a description. You can format the description text as well, which is an improvement on stories, uh, which is plain text only. Uh, you can also password protect the presentation, which you might want to implement if the tools are being used for um, student assessment. And allow duplication option um, is also useful for assessment scenarios. So a tutor could load up a load of digital objects um, in advance and then share a template with their students. Each of them could then add their own commentary to it um, in a fresh version of the presentation and then password protect it for submission. Once those fields are completed, you have a blank canvas on which to start building your presentation. So you can click add item and paste in your first AAAF manifest to add it and then repeat that stage to add multiple manifests. Once the manifest is loaded, you can navigate to any page or section of it and then zoom into a detail you want to add an annotation to. And that will be saved to the area you've zoomed into in exactly the same way as stories. The annotations can be edited, reordered and deleted and the results can be previewed with the preview button. You've got share down there as well, containing all the useful links that you'll need in the future, either to make changes or to share or embed the final version in a website. 
So if you want to have a go at using some of these tools for yourself, I have documented some tutorials in a toolkit called Minimal Digital. I made this during my professional practice fellowship with the RLUK and AHRC. Um, and in case you haven't noticed, I love free stuff. And uh, my motivation was to bring together an introduction to free digital tools for the benefit of anyone lacking access to infrastructure, uh, whether that's a digital repository or storage or server. So it features tools, uh, tutorials, uh, reviews of free online software and workflows to create digital archives and exhibitions. Um, it goes into more detail on the benefits of IIIF, uh, but in accessible language and, and about methods for using and creating IIIF images without an image server infrastructure. It covers quite a lot of what I've talked about today and much, much more. So do take a look at that. Um, we will also be running a few more IIIF IIIF events in the next few months, um, including the training session um, that I mentioned. So um, I hope to see a few of you again soon. And thank you for listening. So yeah, we've got um, one question, which is around sort of metadata. And I know that, yeah, um, that IIIF isn't a metadata standard. So I think it's be useful for people to understand how it interacts with metadata and sort of what you need to do, if anything, to make your metadata work with IIIF. Glenn, can I come to you first and then I'll get on to Alison and what that's meant for her. Sure, yeah, I'd be interested to hear Alison's kind of practical uh, mm -hmm. feedback on that. But um, the intention of uh, IIIF uh, manifest particularly is to have only enough metadata in there um, that is uh, enough for the user to be able to understand what they're looking at. So the IIIF doesn't uh, require a particular metadata standard. Um, it's something that has something called uh, kind of key value pairs. Um, so say, for example, you might have something that says title and title and um, author and author. Uh, and that's absolutely fine, um, but it might not work in a museum setting. So you might have um, creator and then the name of the creator. And so IIIF doesn't control kind of what you call your metadata. It can be anything. So. The idea is that it can uh, work with any metadata standard and you just convert it to the IIIF metadata fields um, and it just has to be enough for the user to be able to understand what they're using. Um, so in your example from National Library of uh, Indonesia, um, hopefully you can convert whatever metadata you have into the IIIF manifest. Um, and as long as it's enough for the user to be able to understand, um, it doesn't matter if it's not in a standard itself. Uh, as long as it's enough for the user to be able to understand what they're doing, then it's probably going to be fine for IIIF. Um, IIIF only, the only mandatory thing that IIIF requires is the label. Um, but obviously, the more metadata you have, the more understandable and usable the data is. So um, it should work with any kind of standards, or if you don't have standards, it should still work. Thank you, Glenn. And Alison, how's it been for you, so taking what you've got and moving it across um, to IIIF? It's a really good explanation. And yeah, the, the process of setting up a digital repository and not, not moving that content from one repository to another, but setting one up from scratch involved a lot of metadata cleaning up and, and was a really good act, activity to do actually, to get everything consistent and coherent. And I just hope that if we do have to move it in future, it will be easier. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, this, as Glenn gave a really good explanation of the setup there. So it really doesn't matter what you're using in your library system, perhaps or whatever is sort of pulled into your digital system can be set up by you. We had to do some mapping from, we use Mark in the library system. We use Dublin Core mm -hmm. in the digital system. And it just involves some mapping of, yeah, what metadata we thought the viewer would most need to see when those objects travel around the web, it's great that you know you can set them free, that they always stay linked to their metadata. Um, they always get connected to back to the library catalog as well. So in a sense, it sort of doesn't hugely matter what metadata is in the viewer because you will come back to the catalog um, ultimately anyway. Thank you. And one of the challenges that we all face, Alison, when looking at implementing something new with our collections is where to start, you know, with what to move and things like that. And obviously it was impacted by the fact that you did just during COVID, but yes. how did you sort of determine, well, where do I start with what would, what would be make sense to move into AAA? I, I maybe had it easier in some regards in that the content that I had, uh, well, it was legacy. It had come from previous projects when we had been involved in digital 
happenings in the past, we had contributed content to other people's projects. It was largely the National Library um, in the context of Wales. The National Library would lead on these digital projects, usually by Glenn, um, and uh, <laughs> and then would would specify, okay, we need this kind of content, this type of metadata, this kind of standard, yeah. and so that is why that phase of standardization had to happen with getting everything to well what what's our standard what do we want to use yeah. and then yeah rather than these things that have been submitted for standalone projects but we did have the benefit of being able to look back on those projects and think what have been successful what have been less successful and what things we wanted to pull forward um and then from then on we've really been sort of demand led so when people have come to us very actively and said we'd love to see this and we'd love to see that and, and that is what drives our um our digitization programs now uh, trying to just keep that alignment with research needs. Thank you. And it's great to see what you've done and see the investment that you've got. It's been um, a journey. Yes. <laughs> and Glenn, I wonder if you could say a bit more about how people can get involved in the community, because I know I've really benefited from the support of other um, members of the AAAF community and being able to go along to talks and hear what others are doing around the world. Sure. So there's many ways um, to get involved and it depends how much time or interest uh, you've got. So probably the easiest way and the kind of lowest barrier is to sign up to the newsletter. So uh, my colleague, uh, Caitlin, sends this out once a month and it's a great highlight of kind of what's going on in the AAAF community. Um, there are also a, a number of um, online Zoom sessions. So we have one roughly once a month uh, where we'll see uh, kind of people presenting about their latest software, the latest implementation, different tools that support AAAF. Uh, and they're really good ones. And then we have um, different interest groups. Uh, so we have one on manuscripts, archives, uh, museums. Uh, we just recently started one on artificial intelligence and AAAF. Um, and they're all open. So there's a, I'll put the link in the chat after I finish, but on the website, there's a, a calendar. Uh, and you're welcome to join any of those calls. Uh, and quite often they're kind of just demonstrations and people talking through uh, what they're doing. Um, we also have um, technical specification groups, which are, uh, again, completely open. And that's where we're trying to push the boundaries of the AAAS specification and creating uh, new extensions. Um, so one that's very active at the moment is um, 3, 3D. Um, so the AAAS 3D group. So at the moment, we support uh, images and audiovisual. Um, but in the next version, uh, we're looking to support 3D models uh, in, in the same sort of infrastructure. Uh, and that's a very active group at the moment. Uh, again, you're all, you're welcome to join any of those discussions. Um, I mentioned the Slack, so the Slack channel um, is a great way just to go in and each of those interest groups have their own kind of channel within Slack. Uh, and so you can just kind of follow the discussions. Um, it's also got a beginner's channel if you want to kind of ask questions. Um, and there's also a technical channel where you can kind of monitor uh, the latest discussions on, on where the standards are going. Um, but yeah, everything's open. Um, you're welcome to join anything and thanks Claire's put the the link to the events um so you can see all of the online events there and um there are usually two or three different triple life meetings a week uh, for various uh, groups and TSGs um so only join the ones you want to interested in um I definitely recommend the community call because um, mm -hmm. that's kind of very general purpose the last one we had was on um a crossover between um fair data and triple F uh, and then we're, I think the next one's going to be looking at uh, AAAF Commons, sorry, um, Flickr Commons and how that can relate to AAAF. So they're always kind of really interesting uh, topics. Yeah. And for everybody, if there's something that was discussed in the past that you're interested in, a lot of things are recorded, um, made available um, on the YouTube, but also the AAAF community does open notes as well. So often you can go along and sort of see that it's all in the AAAF Google Drive that you can find as well and their links to um the events i think aren't they so if you want to find out more you you can delve and you can get in deeper and deeper and deeper as i'm sure alison um can testify by finding out what others are doing and what you would like to copy or steal um i always think that is the highest form of flattery isn't it sort of seeing what you can take from it and be influenced by others 